Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome back to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Your host, Thomas Keenan, coming at you today. As you can see, I'm in the home office, getting my things done. And uh, I've got Mr. Callie Keen with us again. This is his second visit on the podcast, and, and I, I'm just excited to dude back in here. Someone who's got a bunch of experience, and um, I think he has a unique perspective on a lot of the things, a lot of situations, a lot of stuff around business, entrepreneurship. I didn't have him back in here with us today to kind of just start jiving and get through some stuff and, and see what he's been up to since, dude, I think it's been, it's got to be close to two years since the last time. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think it has been about two years, and I uh, appreciate the intro and kind of talking me up here, but but yeah, we, we circulate and we have a lot of mutual friends, so I always like to you see what you're up to, and uh, I'm really appreciative to be back on the show. And we're in a totally different place in civilization now than we were two years ago. So I've got lots to talk about. The whole world has changed in so many ways. So. Yeah, it really has. Um, just give me give me some thoughts there, man. Let's let's kind of let's kind of unpack that a bit because you're saying we're in a different place civilization wise, and like I think people need to understand and see some of the perspective outside of the traditional entrepreneurial uh, circles that we both run in. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously everybody was kind of at home. I think the last time that we talked and we were on my show. And one of the reasons that I had started a podcast and started a show and put out social media and really ramped that up was because I used to do events. I used to speak at all over the place, locally at universities, communities, but, you know, and like trade shows, things like that. And I had a, pretty decent brand around product development, manufacturing. You asked me a question about like, how do I turn product into an invention or how to, you know, turn an invention into a business. Those are normally things that I would talk about. I, I really like doing that. I like talking to people about ideas and that all just went away immediately. And so tried the clubhouse thing, tried the, you know, streaming thing, tried the Facebook thing, but the podcast is really what stuck. And that's, um, that's how I think we first really interacted outside of the <laughs> clubhouse yeah. is such a weird, weird time in life. But I, <laughs> I did, I did get a chance to meet some really good, great people I, that I do business with today. Yeah. You know, I knew them through those circles, but then to be able to interact with them on that platform, you know, I can't say it was all bad, but now we're, we can have events again. We can have friends again, mm -hmm. but it's not quite the same as it was before. And it's not the same as it was two years ago. So I'm, I'm kind of navigating through that. But yeah, the it's it's like the world went through something, and it's it's just shifted a little bit differently. The way that people interact, the way they hold themselves accountable for their time, uh, and what they say they're going to do, uh, it's just different. It feels so different. Have you experienced that? It's so like time is kind of fluid. Like I'm yes. gonna, I, yeah, really odd. Time time seems to be moving a lot faster than than before. And I know that that's part of it has to do with age as well. I mean, I've, I've always found the older I get, the faster time moves. But especially over the last three years, I mean, like, dude, it's just ripping through. It's moving extremely fast. And then looking from a technological side of things, like we've, we've got these 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 hot topics right now. You've got all the AI and ChatGPT and all this stuff. And that is just evolving just stupid fast. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like every other day, there's a new update. Oh, hey, this this thing can now do this. And like, okay, like, what's going to happen a year from now? What's going to happen two years from now? Where are we going to be? So just just some like deep questions that I, I like to ask, I like to read up on and educate myself a little bit more. And I'm sure you do as well. I, I say this with love and respect, but we're fucking nerds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, so when people ask me like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, if I had an overarching theme, I tell them, well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like a hired nerd. Basically, you want to figure something out, you hire me. And that's a broad accompaniment of, of, of that. But I was just talking to a friend about about AI and they're like, have you ever built anything with AI? And I'm like, yeah, for probably more than five years, we've been building things with AI and ML. And I'm like, I run accelerators for, for tech, right? And work in startup world. And just recently, I started combining like what I do with startups with like what I do in the kind of entrepreneurship circles. And I realized like I wasn't really mixing those two <laughs> groups of people. So they weren't really, they're like, what you do, you do this. I'm like, yeah, I actually, <laughs> I actually do. Like, you know, yeah, we've raised like tens of millions of dollars in, in, in tech. And like I coach hundreds of people through startups and raising money. And it's like, it just seems like kind of irrelevant when you're talking to people in, in like a different world, but yeah. the, the AI piece 
slam those worlds together, man. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I had somebody in an accelerator over five years ago, and you could type in a phrase and it would search the data and it would give you a natural response like chat GPT. It wasn't just like that easy. And so because I make things like vision systems, like uh, a buddy of mine invented a thing, you pull out a, a handgun in like a mall, it knows immediately that it's a handgun, not a toy, who the thing is, contacts the authority. Uh-huh. One of the leading companies that we've been building vision systems and signal analysis systems for electronic warfare and data analysis systems for national security for yeah. a long time, right? Yeah. That stuff was only available to us. Now with ChatGPT, it's like, Give me an implementation plan for marketing. Boom, you know? Boom there it is. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, it's, it's funny you say that. I started experiencing AI in the professional world probably five years ago, and maybe even more at this point. And, and I, I was still involved in my last service based company, and we installed GPS tracking and dash camera systems. And we started to experience AI dash camera world. So we would often have the same generic box. I know this is the hardware you're putting in the vehicle but they would load that piece with different software depending upon which company was was using that hardware. And some of the companies that we were working with were doing some next level stuff and an AI overlay on the software. So I'll give you a, for instance, some of the dash cameras that we were installing could detect if a driver went through a red light, a stop sign and or a pedestrian was in front of the vehicle moving. It would then have an LED display and give the driver active feedback saying, hey, you've got a problem going on here. And that's, that's, that's mobilized claim to fame. I don't know if you're familiar with that company, but also now in the dash camera world, what they're doing was scoring the drivers and how they were driving through the day. So we went from the world of accelerometers built into these tracking devices and dash cameras where they could tell what the G-forces were, so braking, cornering, that kind of stuff, uh, aggressive starts. And now they're combining that with the data from the AI that's being read from the dash camera, because now the dash camera is also the tracking device, which a lot of people don't know. And it's got this AI overlay on the software platform and they're scoring the driver at the end of the day and giving him a scorecard and and basically red light, yellow light or or green light kind of deal. Like, hey, you did good today or you drove like a shithead. And these are the three incidents. So so the driver gets back to the the hub for the day and the fleet manager comes out and, and reviews his scorecard for the day and coaches him how to be better. And there's a lot of pluses and minuses, to, uh, mostly pluses in my opinion, because from the driver's perspective, it's, oh, I got big brother watching me at all times. Yeah. From the man and company perspective, it's, hey, we're trying to improve safety. We're trying to improve efficiency. And we're trying to also lower our maintenance costs for these vehicles. So if you've got one or two vehicles in your fleet, who gives a shit? Like your maintenance is your maintenance. When you've got a fleet of 500 vehicles, a slight tweak on the front end of this, which is now coming from the data from the AI, could save you millions of dollars in maintenance repairs that year. So pretty wild to just watch how that, the technology has evolved and, um, and now see that it's gone much more mainstream than it had been. I mean, that's the big, that's the big change is that it's, it's mainstreamed and it's not just that it's mainstream in its application, but that mainstream everyday people can create mainstream applications for it. And this is the game changer is I've been pushing this for a, a few years and said, hey, look, when there's a downturn, what's going to happen is there's going to be a hollowing out of the middle of the market. What I mean by that is everyone kind of knows, especially if you work with big businesses, you kind of know that the HR department, well, most of the people in the marketing department, most of the people in the employee relation, customer relations, sales, like everybody that, that touches paper, they're a bad robot could replace them, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a majority of them. And then that middle layer of management, really, they're not adding value. If you're not adding value to the customer's experience in a very like direct way, they tell people, look, you need hard skills. I, I, I'm like, I'm super unpopular in these like entrepreneur circles because I'm, I'm like, look. That's why I love guys, you, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like wildly unpopular. I, I, I don't care, but like, but I, I I'm like the wet blanket. Hey, I'm going to give a dissenting opinion. You need to have real skills. So if you want to go into sales, actually know how to sell. Like, those books are great. You know, those trainings are great. Take them. But like, go sell something for the love of God. Like, actually go do it. You got to have some real deal skills because if you don't, somebody like me is going to write a little program that replaces you. And like, 
now that isn't a fantasy or me being mean. It just happened a couple months ago. So if you're a copywriter, I said, hey, man, you got to be really good. You got to you got to understand the emotion of this and how the, you have to understand the customer, the problem, and the product. And you have to really, really be good and be multidisciplinary and understand what the web developer needs and what the marketer needs and what the boss needs. And you need to really understand that as a system of systems and be really, really good. You have to have skills. If you think because you have an English degree that you can write marketing copy or that you took a, you know, an SMMA course that was a month long and you can write you can do copywriting, your job's on the line. And like, that's why people would be so mad at me all, all the time because I'd say, put, you know, put down the inspirational book, mm-hmm. pick up an aspirational book. Like, I'm going to learn this really hard thing. And uh, today, all of those jobs are gone. Like they're, 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 there's like a ticking counter on everybody's head. It says like, dude, nobody's going to ever replace a plumber and nobody's ever going to replace the, like the inventor that has a new idea, new stupid idea. Everything in the middle, in between, it's got a clock on it. You know, here's a question I got for you. And I 100%. Uh, with this change coming, with with AI getting bigger and better every moment that passes, right? Uh, do we see a resurgence in the trades in the blue collar workers? I mean, look, I, I grew up in the trades. I'm I'm in my manufacturing facility right now, right? I can just like go grab like like right there. There's a thing that I have a patent on that we make, right? Yeah. There's some uh, my friend's product that helped them make a stand for that. If I if I move around, like look, there's some nerdy manufacturing books, toilet books on going lean for, for manufacturing, right? I'm in a manufacturing facility right now. Yeah. Now, like we use a lot of tools that involve machine learning. Like I have a, one of my better horizontal mills. It actually has a thing that captures the sound and it learns the sound of a cut. And if it's an out of condition, it'll adjust the feed rate of that cut. So it goes back in the condition. So it helps you have better finishes and cut parts that are even. You know, it's it's a six hundred thousand dollar machine. It's got to be smart in some way, right? But like at the end of the day, the person that is operating that machine is a blue call is a blue collar job or no collar jobs. You see, like um, right today, it's Friday's shipping day. I'm, da- I'm down on the floor. I went. I was assembling, turning screws, and sanding things. And like we're not a small company, so I, you know, I've got I've got thirty employees here, thirty thousand square foot building like we have another seven thousand square foot facility down the road not a small company but i grew up turning screws i'll probably die turning screws and i'll tell you that there is a resurgence in that because if you're making cool stuff that's never existed before there's no training model on how to do the thing that's never happened in human history we're building new stuff right yeah can I get a robot that turns the same screw over and over again? Can I train that if we were doing mass production of a thing? Absolutely. Do we have advanced software tools that teach the machines how to cut or like, you know, laser cut a thing or how to paint it or how to do that? Of course we do. But at the end of the day, like, <laughs> you know, you have to go down there and like, you actually have to weld something together. We actually have to build it. You have to know how things work. And, and so, yeah, I'm seeing a research in that because those jobs like roofing pays really, really well. Plumbing pays really well. Like electrician, my buddy's an electrician. He's like, oh, I make, he quit his job doing a corporate thing. Became an electrician. He was like, yeah, I'll get paid this much. And then when my apprenticeship is done, I'll get paid this much. I said, man, you're, make, you're making more than most people. Uh, while you're basically, you, you know, you're holding a shovel is they don't let you touch anything. And you, you will get like razzed and pranked by all the people because you know, everybody that works, it's not like that. But yeah, at the end of the day, he'll make six figures, you know, as an electrician uh, after yeah. a year and a half. Right? Yeah, it's true, man. The, this isn't, this isn't the norm because it just is what it is. But some of the successful blue collar guys that I know are in the plumbing trade and those guys they got to do a lot of work on themselves they got to get themselves out of the field and start to really build a business but the guys who are really doing it well are typically running around a 20 percent profit margin and you know that's a good number for a lot of businesses especially if you see what the what the gross tickets are when those guys come into someone's home 
Like, dude, you, you call a plumber and you want him to come in here and do something for you. It's going to be anywhere from 350 to 600 bucks. Like just the second homeboy shows up to your front door. Walking in. Yeah. So those guys have a lot of money and, and pretty quickly if they invest and put the time into really building out the structure of the company and, and implementing systems and processes and bringing on the right people, you know, which is a lot of the thing I both have to do as business owners and stuff that we have done in the past and well. And then you have the other school of people who are just like, no, nah, man, like I'm just stuck in that technician role and like, I'm just going to go and slaughter pipes and, and, you know, cut pecs for the rest of my life and, you know, go it's fucking unclog shit. It, 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 you know, like it, it's like you think of this as people that do really hard work. Sometimes that's the easiest thing for them and, and moving and changing that identity from I'm going to be a technician to a business owner to an entrepreneur. It, the difficult work is between is it, it up here and like, yeah, I, I, I get it. Like processes aren't as cool and you feel like you're really adding value when you, you can like you install something, you do something and you get that shipped and done and build and invoice right that second. You feel like, yeah, I'm doing it, but you're really on a treadmill until yeah. you can develop leadership skills and, and business skills. And yeah, the people that are in the trades that I know, I, one of the richest first pe people I've ever met, uh, he was um, essentially went plumber, plumbing company owner, trades company owner, and then he started rolling up trades companies. So he, mm -hmm. he, his offer was really great. He, he would go to a, you know, your technician and he'd say, look, I know you have three guys, it's killing you, right? They don't show up, you don't know what you're doing, you don't use of money because you're not invoicing it's a nightmare so here's what i'll do for you i'll buy your business you still own your business you run my franchise model slap my logo on there you'll make more money than you make right now you'll have less stress i will help you hire the people i'll help you train the people you run my software you buy all the gear all the stuff from me and so he did all the the you know uh, back office stuff inventorying stuff purchasing mm -hmm. everything and he was like, the people thought I was like going to scam them because they would make more money. And then all they had to do was like go and do the work again, but they were making six figures instead of chasing their tail. But I mean, he, he was making over a hundred million dollars easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Um, I started late and I, I want to talk into this uh, uh, window of learning here in a minute too. Around the age of 35 and I kind of pulled my head out of my butt and started self-developing heavy and, and learning, right? And before that, I was just a skilled technician. And I met this dude just as I started to learn. Um, my Snap-on dealer connected me with him. And I was still in the automotive space at this point. My Snap-on dealer connected me with him and said, hey, I want you to meet this guy named Michael. And I was living on, on Long Island at the time. Michael, I'll leave his last name out here because I don't want to give away his business. But M Michael was a very successful dude and a bit off his rocker, not in a bad way. And he's like, hey, I got this work van of mine. And he goes, I want a bunch of cameras on it. And I heard you're the guy who can make it happen. Yeah, cool. So I went, I drove out to uh, to Michael's home. And he lived on a piece of property. that was about four acres in the middle of wine country in the North Fork of Long Island. And if anybody knows that area, you know that it is quite exclusive, right? We're talking like millions of bucks for those houses. Millions. I'm like, so I roll up to this dude's house. And I'm like, oh, wow, this house is gorgeous. As I pull up and get closer, that's not his house. It's the fucking garage. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, long story short, wind up interacting with this guy. And I wind up doing a bunch of business with him. I, I did, I think, two or three really large audio video projects on his vehicles for him. When I say really large, I'm talking like 30K and above. And if you know anything about cut cars and audio video, that, that's, a, that's a banger of a system. Let's put it that way. So I got to, to talking to this guy and doing this work and I was going out to his house all the time and, and kind of showing up and doing some stuff with him. And I noticed that his shop is filled with cool cars, classic cars, custom things he's building. There's welded all over the place, his metal fab, this wood fab stuff all over the place. And his his work van that we worked on is a, a Mercedes Sprinter loaded with tools, like really high end specialty technician tools from Snap-on and some other companies I never even heard of. Sitting in the front seat, he's got this case and in this case is this computer and he was explaining to me he's like hey just do me a favor be real careful like don't let any of your guys near that computer make sure if he goes that it, it's it's a really expensive piece so now like my curiosity's peaked this guy's living in this ridiculous house and i see that he turns wrenches for a living I'm like hold on a second i turn wrenches for a living i don't have any of this 
So maybe there's something I can learn from this guy, right? Start talking to him. The dude's a marine mechanic, a marine diesel mechanic. And he only specializes in in servicing extremely high-end yachts for very famous people. He goes to them. They make a phone call. He shows up. And his average ticket is anywhere from 25 to 50K to come service their, their yachts. He's like uh, the dude who will just show up and fix shit, do back and functional, operational, when you are like in your worst time of need. Right? He's like the, the fix, we'll call it. Um, and very well known for his specialty and what he does and literally gets picked up and flown around the world on a jet quite, quite often and goes and fixes famous people's boats. Okay, cool. So now this is even more intriguing, but learning a lot from the guy and now I start hearing and he's talking about, you know, Hey, like you, you started and his family had owned a, um, a local hardware store and he grew up fixing lawnmowers and stuff. How did you go from this? to what you're doing now, but also accumulating all this massive wealth that you have. And um, he's like, I just kept making money and the money that I made, and I went and invested it and good investing in real estate. And then real estate led into commercial real estate and the commercial real estate led into marinas and the marinas led into all of this stuff. And I was like, whoa, how did you start? And how did, how did all this start coming together? And he's like, I just started to read. It's like, that's it. He's like, yeah, I started to read. And he goes, then I started getting around people who were at a different level than me quite intentionally. And I would, Shut yeah. my mouth. Just listen to what they had to say. And he goes, now, at this point in time, I'm already a, a diesel marine mechanic. So people who are um, interacting, if they have smaller boats or yachts at this time, like they've got some extra cash flow hanging around. If you got a $600,000 boat and it's your toy just for two or three months of the summer in Long Island, you've got some extra coin floating around. So we started listening to these people and interacting more. And the dude became extremely wealthy with the knowledge that he gained and then reinvested over and over and over again. So just a cool story, and, and I, I kind of bring it up, I want to just point out to people like, hey, just because you turn a wrench doesn't mean you can't be a wealthy individual, right? Before I let you dive in on it, I mentioned the age of 35 when I when I started mentioning, uh, talking about this. I was listening to an audio book in my car years ago, and it was talking about the window, and it's broken up into different segments. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but right around the age yeah. of either... I think it's 36 or 37 years of age. That's the final window. And when that window closes, we can't truly learn. However, if you get in before that time period, you have a good chance of really diving in and, and basically just evolving at a rapid pace yourself. Is it tr true? I don't know. But all I can talk about is my experience with it, right? And and I went in, like I said, at the age of 35, I started doing some heavy duty lifting on myself. And um, like, am I doing great? I don't know if I'm doing great, but I'm definitely not doing bad. Put it that way. I'm doing a hell of a lot better than where I was at the age of 35 when I started going down this road. <laughs> I like that. So. Uh, I think I think uh, there's a lot of contributing factors to that. I'm sure that there's some biological, neurological piece to the way that your brain connects those neural pathways. But in general, you think around that same time that you, you might start having children, you might be married, you might have these responsibilities where you end up thinking like, I'll just stick with the same path and I'll settle for incremental growth. And I don't think that incremental growth exists. It's, it's kind of a lie. This, this like, I'll do this and I'll perpetually uh, easily grow. Because if you were to do the, the math behind that, this is like the world is moving against you. It's like saying that I'm going to put my money in a checking account and I get interest on it. So my money is going to come inflation right the inflation is the progress of reality so you're if you slow your progress of growth whether that's personal growth if that's skills in your in your industry you're going to be easily outthought and outmatched by just the nature of reality itself and we can all fall victim to this or we can know that there is different seasons in our life and we can change who we are and what we're focused on because we understand like this is when uh, I was in my twenties, I wanted to be the smartest person in the room. That was, that was, I, I wanted to know, and, and I like learning about a lot of different things and see what is that connected piece in between these things. It's like, um, what's the, what's the connection between language and programming? Like, what's the connection between this mechanical system and then the, 
psychology of, of this this market? Like, what are all these disparate things and how they connect together? Really into that. Really into wanting to be smart. Want to be a smart person. So I was in smart person rooms, and there would be people that were far smarter than me. Uh, there'd be people that were smarter than me that were generalists, people that were smarter than me that were experts. And that was great. But I realized something was that overall, in general, the smartest people weren't the happiest person and they weren't the most successful people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they had spent their time and they were 40, 50 years old being a technician inside of that vein. They were very good at that thing, which was non-correlative to a broader concept of success. And so I was like, man, what, what the people that are successful, they've been able to take this and then work with other people. So I was like, okay, life is a group project. I need to get really good at taking whatever those skills are and connecting, not ideas, which is amazing, right? I think the world needs generalists. Uh, generalists are entrepreneurs, and then you can use specialists. That's great. But the, the theme there is that with entrepreneurs, we have to be really good at connecting people together. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well, I want to go out and I want to help people. So in my 30s, I focused on getting to know people, being the most connected person. So being like uh, a way that I've described it, uh, have a talk on this is the wizard versus the barbarian. The barbarian fights against everything and that is successful in the struggle. And the wizard thinks about things and makes them happen. And it seems like magic, but like, you go through this season of like acquiring all these skills, struggling against this thing. And then my, my objective is to then understand how they're connected together and connect them with people, not ideas. So I, I think when you get older, you have to come to this like age of wisdom. And this is what I've been calling our like post AI world right now is that uh, knowledge is irrelevant. Like, Knowing information, the internet pretty much killed that. But then mm -hmm. now with AI, it's going to be truly killed. Like you don't need to know the capital of the city or like how to do much of anything. Like you won't need to know how to do your taxes, file a report, write a paper. You won't need to know any of those things. But the why of it, the why will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And so what I believe about your window of learning is one, you build skills and then you increase the surface area of your luck by knowing as many people and helping as many people as possible. But then you have to enter this, this age of wisdom where you're, you're lo looking at yourself and being like, I need to develop myself as a leader. I need to develop myself so I'm actually happy. And I need to figure out what the hell I want. So mm -hmm. I make sure that I'm not building my prison and I'm building like the, I'm, I'm not building like, you know, like my, yeah, like golden palace, that's my personal hell. I'm building this thing that I actually want. And so I think that at 35, some got to get in on that. It's like, okay, I've spent all this time. I know, I know stuff. I'm old enough where people will listen to me. So I got to build a team. I got to build a circle and I got to figure out how to connect these dots so I can get what the hell I want. But most people have never asked themselves what they want and why they do what they do. And so uh, this is why you see midlife crises. This is why you see people give up. This is why you see all of those other problems. People like, you know, you come to this realization, like, why the hell have I been doing anything I've been doing my entire life? And uh, yeah, and that's, I don't know. Hopefully somebody joins a good group, gets a mentor, mm -hmm. you know, talks to somebody like yourself who's gone through this, you know, awakening. Or I could be like, look, I don't have all the answers, but here's some answers to get you started. I have kind of level. What do you think, Doc? That is like that's a pretty broad, broad uh, slash at your, at your topic. yeah. It is, but you bring up some value things, especially here at the end. And you know, like I, I for me personally, finding a mentor has been a big thing for me, and I've I've had several over my we'll call it my tenure, right? My my time in the scroll and if i look back at it in time it wasn't always someone who was like a paid coach oftentimes it started with you know someone in the family who i looked up to kind of took me under their wing and showed me how to do things and and poured into me and then as i grew up and started to go out and experience the world a bit more it turned into other people who i was interacting with at that point in time and i have this theory i think i talk about it in my book too if i remember correctly i wrote the damn thing so long ago i don't fucking remember anymore <laughs> 
<laughs> should probably go back and reread my own book. Uh, I got this stepping stone theory when it comes to, to mentorship or coaches, right? And, and and granted, they are different, but they are also very similar. My, the stepping stone theory for me is like you, you have this person, you step on this stone and you absorb all of this information and knowledge that this person is willing to pour into you. And at some point in time, you take it all from them and you wind up getting heavier. And the, the heavier you are, that stone begins to sink, right? And at that point, you need to to pivot and go to the next stone so you can get more information or you're stuck there fucking permanently. And, you know, looking back over the history of, of my evolution and my path, my personal path, I've had several stones that I've had to step on and pivot as well. And uh, for instance, one of the stones that I had to step on and pivot away from was a couple of years ago when I left my last company. Like when I started in that company, it was... 2009, I was uh, 29 years old or 30. I was just, I was one month away from my 30th birthday. Started that company and my my ex-business partner was 10 years my senior. So he was someone who I was absorbing and getting a lot of this information from because he had spent a lot more time. It was a bit more polished than me at the time and spent time on the corporate things and brought over that that skill set. And that's how we kind of merged this blue collar world with this, this corporate skill set and then turned it into a, a company that was actually doing some shit. But I had to learn a lot of that from him. And again, eventually it got to a point where I had absorbed all, all that and I needed, like, I yearned for more, right? And like you, you want to be the smartest person in the room. I've never had that want, but I've always, always had this want for more. Infant. Like, you can't give me enough of it, especially if it's yeah. what I want to learn. And um, it just got to a point, you know, for several reasons. And one of the reasons was like, hey, I got what I got out of this dude. And now I need to go put that to another area that actually interests me more. That's more aligned with me. And if you want to use the purpose and the why shit, a lot of that applies to it as well. But just, I just want to kind of nail home, nail home the point here for those who are listening. Like, it's okay. And you're probably at some point in time going to outgrow the mentor or coach that you were. And if you have a mentor or a coach who says, no, 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 you have to stay here forever with me, you're with the wrong fucking person. 100%. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's also a lot to be said for coaches and mentors that help you do something in a, like a finite basis. It's like, I want to learn this or I want to add this piece to me. And this is, there's, there's like a lot to unpack about this, but people hire they hire mentors. I don't know. Like, you know what I'm saying? They, they aspire to be someone. They might join a program. They might uh, hire a coach. And I'd say like, I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in paying to accelerate anything that you're trying to do, whether that's take a course, take a class that's $50, 5,000. Like uh, we, we buy training for the, the guys here that the training might be five, ten thousand dollars just to use a piece of equipment. I'm a big fan of it, right? It accelerates your success. But like, look at that person. Do they know how to do the thing that you're trying to do? Have they done it successfully? Does their outcomes match what your expectations are? And oftentimes online, the answer is no. And like what they're offering, is that the thing that you actually need or do you want to be cool? And there's a huge difference. I'm like a big fan of not being cool because mm -hmm. I, I just want to like what I'm doing. I want to be, I want to respect the outcome of what I'm doing. Um, cool is like a subjective thing from the outside. Like I don't give a shit if somebody thinks I'm cool or not. Like, uh, I, I would just, I just want to feel good about what I've done versus, uh, you know, whatever. The other thing will take care of itself, but like mentors, one, they don't have to be paid. Some of the best mentors I've had have been customers, right? Um, somebody I work with, they, they just sold their business for 217 million to a $16 billion company. And like that guy's taught me all kinds of stuff. Not only it, not only did I not pay him for that, he's paid me close to $20 million over the course of our business relationship. So like he's taught me all kinds of stuff and he's paid me a lot of money. Right. And, and those opportunities are out there. That doesn't happen every time, but it does happen. So like men mentorship is, is like, it's a thing for that moment in time and really helped. And, I might not have been where I needed to be to absorb all of that knowledge. I might need to keep working for two years and I circle back to that relationship and be like, man, I missed 90% of what he said. Mm -hmm. I thought I was beyond it, but I was beyond what I could absorb at that time. So I got to go back and like, now I'm ready to be dumb again. I thought I was so smart. Now uh, I'm ready to like learn another 10% of what mm -hmm. you got. Cause, you know, but like, it, it's a tricky thing. I just, I'm a big fan of, of trying 
to get out, you know, get that third party, you know, to help help out. Yeah. You need to get your head out of your ass kind of situation. Yeah, for sure. You made a good point here. And I'll, I'll give a quick story on it too, from my experience and perspective with it. You talked about hiring someone to help you with a very specific need as far as a coach is concerned, which I think is a brilliant idea. I had, I got to this speaking engagement. I asked to go, I was asked to go speak at this event in Salt Lake City over the summer. I went out there, I spoke and um, I, I sat in the only open seat in, in the audience to kind of listen to everyone else talk for me kind of deal. And I went up sitting next to this woman who owns a dog training company. I had some good conversation with her. And afterwards, she reaches out to me a couple of weeks later and she goes, hey, I'd like to hire you uh, for some coaching. Okay, cool. So I started talking to her, learn a little bit more about her. And she's like, I don't, I'm interested in your mastermind. I'm not inter interested in interacting with any of the people in your circle. She goes, I need to spend some one-to-one -one time with you. I have a very specific need. Are you open to that? Sure. Like, what do you want? Um, long story short, she wanted help in dialing in her company culture in particular, mm. right? Okay, cool. I've, I've been there a couple of times. I can definitely help you there. So I wound up putting together a custom package that I normally wouldn't offer to somebody for this woman because she came to me and said, I have a very specific need. And I knew that I had the skill set up for her and say, yeah, this is exactly what we're going to do. How we're going to dial this in and help you evolve and make some changes here, right? And this is someone who has, she's, I think at this point in time, she's got 50 or 55 people on her team across across three businesses that she owns. She she doesn't need my help in the business coaching realm. She's actually gone out and done a lot more than I ever have, right? So cool. But she had a very specific need and she came and asked for my help in that arena. So yeah, let's roll. So I, I think that's an important point to make. If you're someone who's listening to this and you want to go look for someone for that coach or look, hey, and you've determined I've got this specific need I need fixed. Cool. Go in and ask someone who you think may be a good fit and they do something new and you'd be surprised how many times they say yes. Yeah. I mean, that is closer to what I do for my day-to-day -day job. It's like, I'm a, I'm a consultant, right? At the end of the day, I, I, I you know, I joke and say like, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a nerd on tap or, you know, I'm a hired geek. But it, that's essentially what it is. Somebody has a specific problem. And I put together a proposal. It might be developing product, but it might also be like developing channel partners to then take that partner that product to market. Or you know, really along that spectrum of I want I have an idea. I want to turn this idea into a business. So like that's all that's what I do. But uh, I've I've always been a consultant, and then entering that kind of online market with coaches was like this is really different because you're giving people a dream goal versus when I'm a consultant, I'm like, oh, we're going to do this together. But, you know, I understand like I work for, I work for the top U.S. Auto, auto manufacturer, right? I work for, you could name a top tech company. I've developed a product or sold my product to them. Like you can name any defense company that's, that's over a few billion dollars and they're, they're, I've, developed a product for them mm -hmm. and like so for for those companies they have all, all the resources in the world and so i want to tie this up for for people that are listening is like there's nothing that lockheed can't do there's nothing that google can't do but there's a lot that they can't do because they're burdened with experience yeah they have they have all these resources and if you're listening like you might be super successful you might have a hundred billion dollar company and the more successful you are, the greater your needs are. You're burdened with experience of all the times it didn't work, of all the ways it can't work, all the people and mouths that you have to feed, all of this piece. So like you, the more successful that you are, the more you should be reaching out to people that are not you, that are not burdened with your life and your experience. They're just burdened with their skills to execute for you. And that's like why coaches are so awesome, why consultants are so awesome. They can do that one thing that even though you have all the money, you have all the employees, you have the lab, you have the whatever, whatever every single market I've seen this from, from sales and marketing to uh, science, all the way, I've seen the same exact problem. The people that have all the resources, they can't get out of their own way to get the thing done because they're burdened with experience. And so uh, you go out there and, and somebody like, that lady with the dog training, they 100% need to reach out to you. It's not that they can't do it. They mm -hmm. can't do it in the time frame that's needed, and they cannot afford to learn how to do it from your years of experience, and they know that they've failed several times in the past to try to do this. 
it is a breakthrough yeah. to make that investment. If I can hand Thomas, if I can hand you like ten thousand dollars and you can fix my company culture, like it's going to make me a multiple of the revenue that I have on tap. So for me, that might make me a million bucks every year from now to the end of time. Yeah. And, I don't know. That's why I like consulting. So you also get charge a lot more because your insights are immediately <laughs> real festival. But um, yeah, 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 it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it's true. But you know, um, I think a lot of times people kind of get caught up in in the ROI of it. Like, oh, and 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 part of the problem is people are, are oftentimes for that immediate ROI. Like, oh, I'm going to go spend a dollar here. I expect ten back. Well. <laughs> You can, but you're going to have to go ahead and do some work first and let this thing kind of roll out and implement as well. So th I think that's just a, uh, a lot of it has to do with human nature. People just are impatient. And I think a lot of it has to going back to our talk earlier with just the way that things are moving faster and the way that society is right now. Um, but there has to be some level of patience that gets inserted or instilled into the entrepreneur. And I see a lot of this with, with visionary leaders where they come out and they're like, hey, I got this great new idea. I'm like, I expected my team to hop all over it and do it right now. And they expect it launched and live and, and, and breaking money in within 40 years. That hurts. That hurts me just thinking of it, right? Because I'm also the guy who's the back end who's had to go and build those systems. And then halfway through building it, the, the visionary leader says, hey, I, I'm, I'm done with that. I moved on to the next thing and we're going to do this now. So I'm sure you've dealt with some of that stuff in, in your world too. And I can only imagine what it does, you know, from the manufacturing standpoint where someone gives you a project and, and three quarters of the way through, they're like, oh yeah, we got to make this change. <laughs> yeah. They look at my contract and they realize with that, that 50% billable, it is on cancellation. They say, well, maybe you need to finish it. <laughs> yeah. That's smart. That's real smart. So, Hey man, um, dude, we, we came in here and, uh, I, I think we had a great conversation today. I think we went in a couple of different directions that I wasn't expecting, but I'm cool with it for sure. Uh, and I just kind of, I want to say thank you for coming in and, and, and I'll also just give you the need to share where people can connect with you and learn more about you, your companies and your services and how you can help them. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, I appreciate a uh, chance to catch up. It's been, it's been a while. Um, but it, here's, here's a, the funny thing. I know everybody knows Alex from Rosie, but they just, I'm not. No, I'm not going to pretend like I'm, you know, a hundred million dollar man or super successful. Like I'm, I'm trying to build a hundred million dollar business. So I'm on the pathway to it, and for that reason, in general, I don't have anything to sell people. But I, I really love helping them, and I will offer anybody. Um, we can hop on a Zoom or a Teams call. I'll talk about your business, about your idea for thirty minutes. Um, if you if you're farther along. Then yeah, maybe we can do something together. But the chance is ninety nine point nine percent of the time, I I can solve a problem that you have, and I have nothing to sell you. So I don't want to rip off, uh, you know, Hermosi, but like, it is what it is. Uh, on that is I do have a new podcast launching next week called cool. the Startup Defense, which it does combine two things that are really important to me. One is my entrepreneurial world, the startup world, and then it is the defense world. So like. That's what I, I grew up in defense manufacturing. So we uh, look at this and innovation is the key to making our community, our, our community better, right? Our world better, but it's also the thing that will prevent us from, you know, falling into the ocean or, or, you know, just losing what we have as a country or, uh, you know, global civilization. So mm -hmm. I'm really big on figuring out how to solve massive problems. That's what we're going to talk about on the startup defense. And uh, if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll give you the link and it launches on the 4th of April. So. April 4th, 2023. 4th. Awesome. Yep. There we yep. go. Yeah, so, that sounds good, man. Send me that link when you can, and we'll definitely get that added to the show notes because by the time this episode is live, you'll, you'll have your episode up as well. That's awesome. All right. Yeah, man. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you for tuning in to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Make sure you head over to stepitupentrepreneur.com and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast.